So things such as pain tolerance um, or anxiety or um, maybe uh, depression, things that might be going on in your body and with people that need support to help through whatever's going on. So a lot of times too, we let people know that a music therapist can be found any place that you think of where you would see a nurse. So let me see if I can see the chat here. Can somebody just start putting in the chat places where you've seen a nurse? Hospital, yep, that's a good one. A doctor's office, yep, school, that's a good one, yep. Anybody else have another place that you've seen a nurse, a nursing home? Our care facilities. And even places like emergency rooms or if someone is going to receive treatment for um, cancer or if they have um, a, a kidney disease where they have to go in and, and receive a treatment. Music therapy can be found in those places to ease those transitions and those times to help support people in need in those places. So just a little bit more about my background. I went to college and studied music therapy. Um, you have a four-year degree at a college and then you have an internship that's full-time for six months. And um, there's also the opportunity to go on to get your master's. And one of the programs here in Iowa, there are two colleges in Iowa that offer music therapy as a full degree program. One is Wartburg College and one is the University of Iowa. And at Wartburg College where I went, I was able to study both music therapy and music education. So I really liked that combination to help give me more of the tools um, that I would use to go into music therapy. So um, just also to give a nod, I have instruments with me. I also have plants and I will touch a bit on um, forest and music or forest and nature therapy that I do also. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. I just would like to show this. Let me see if I can show the PowerPoint here. Uh, I just pulled it up early. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you see a PowerPoint now? And a picture of me. <laughs> this picture, um, if if anybody looks on a lot of my information, it's now my, my tile that indicates um, just a snapshot of me in action. During the pandemic, we have all had to do things in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I had to do is starting to wear more um, protective equipment. And so that include mask, face shield, and in my guitar here too, I've got a face mask on my guitar so that it could help protect my patients and make sure that things weren't coming into the guitar and then going back out. So. As music therapists, we not only are watching how music is helping, we also want to make sure that we're not doing anything that's causing additional concerns for anyone. So we have to make sure that we're following the same guidelines. Um, we also, uh, okay, now it's, it's kind of slow. I have a video. If we have time, I'll come back to this. In this video, it shows um, music therapy, I was with a patient and where we were, it, they wanted to take a video. And so at the end of our time, I can always come back to this, um, but it was an opportunity that I was working with a patient I had on full protective equipment and he was able to still engage and interact. Um, some things that we're looking for in memory care might be singing along. Um, in this one, you can see 
that I'm with someone who is joining in and singing. I use very, very animated facial features when I'm engaging to help encourage people to want to participate. Also, sometimes if people are having a hard time hearing, seeing your face can be really important. So we learned in the pandemic that some people actually did really well with support through platforms like Zoom. Um, we also have HIPAA compliant or uh, patient information safety platforms where you can work with people in a one-on-one -on -one or a small group setting to provide music therapy in a way that's safe. Um, this is uh, one of the times that I was with a memory care group, and by memory care, that can be anything from dementia to Alzheimer's or people that may have a diagnosis of Parkinson's that affects their memory. And they've done a lot of research that finds that music can trigger memories. Somebody that can no longer speak might be able to still sing a song with us. And so we give really strong cues. I'll show you that quick here with a guitar. On your screen right now, are you able to see part of the presentation and like a little version of me? Yeah? Ah, I love the thumbs up. I love this. We're all learning and growing and giving each other good cues. So I'm just going to do something here with my guitar. Can you hear it okay? All right. As you're going along in music, especially Western music, you start to get a feel for what it's going to sound like next. You start to say like, okay, I have an idea where this is going. You can see I bounce my head a lot. That's a cueing thing. It's also a fun thing that we do with music. Music makes us want to move. here for a very long time and I start to change the tempo some people might start to look around and wonder did she space out what is going on because you've already by now realized that you want that pattern to resolve you knew what was going to be coming next you have a sense of how that compels you drums are another example in this picture that beat, that rhythm, it compels you to want to engage and participate. So your body is moving, you're breathing. Um, I probably could have looked at my heart rate and been able to see. We had an interesting group like this where we were in a small room and each time we would meet, the temperature in the room would go up by at least three degrees in the room because we were all moving and singing and every time we would literally heat up that room. So that can be really important for people who aren't maybe moving their bodies as much, who aren't engaging their minds as much, who aren't always interacting with one another. You can see here people are smiling and, and supporting each other in a positive way. So um, that's just an example. Music therapists um, try to make sure that we understand what's happening with the music, how people are interacting. And we want to make sure that we're not doing anything that's uncomfortable. Some of these people might have a um, painful if they have to reach above their head. So you want to make sure it's something that we're helping to support and make benef more beneficial. All right, let's see here on the next slide. Okay, I have a picture of my harp and wanted to just touch on this as a therapeutic instrument. Not all music therapists play the harp. It's something that I added to the work um, that I was doing, especially in hospice. Hospice is at the very end of life. Um, and a lot of times families are wanting to come together and be close and have more calm. Music is another good area where there's a quote, it says, where words fail, music speaks. So you don't always have to say the right words. You don't have to say anything at all. 
music can speak in those situations that it's hard to find the words or maybe there aren't the words. And so harp has been one of the ways that I can help support people in those times um, and be with people in those moments in a really sensitive way. I wanted to share these pictures here. I work with other professionals in one of these pictures. The person that's with me is a hospice chaplain. And the gentleman that we were working with, it was one of his favorite memories to think about gathering around the campfire with his friends and singing. And so I played the banjo, the chaplain played the guitar, and we sang songs together. We brought in a, a makeshift fire, and I put a, a close-up picture on the side here too, that we brought that to life. And he was so happy. At the very end of my presentation, if you want to read more about that, they wrote an article about this it's called All My Life's a Circle, and it's based on a very, a very favorite song of his that he would sing around the campfire. He felt like his life had gone in circles and that that was really fulfilling to him. And to gather around the campfire in a circle, to sing together and support each other was something that was so important to him. And he said that for days people would come by and say, oh, remember when you had that fire in your room? I swear we could feel the the heat coming from it. And they asked, they would joke around, did you roast marshmallows? Did you? <laughs> and he loved that. He, it was one of his favorite things that he was able to still share with people through the music and through the recreation of the campfire experience. Um, and I wanted to share this picture. Again, it's uh, my friend, the chaplain, um, her name is Kelsey. And we've done some support for patients through our Zoom conferences like this or through the, the platform, it's called Doxy, um, where we're supporting patients and families, we're singing, um, encouraging conversation. It makes it just a little bit more interesting and engaging to have this support. So I have these links and we can come back to them. Um, before I go, I wanted to show you just a couple more instruments that I've used in music therapy. This one's kind of a fun one. I've also used this. I've used this in nature and forest, guided forest therapy, um, just to help when your mind is kind of wandering, this sound can bring you back to being in the moment. Can you hear that okay? It definitely has its own feel. I've worked with individuals who had a native background and I would play the native flute and they would drum um, and that was their expression. Again, they didn't have to have specific words. They just had that experience in those moments and were supported in that experience. So that's one of the examples. I have taken and I've encouraged just interest in different string instruments. You'll probably figure out I really love instruments. I love challenging myself to learn new things. It has a different sound. And you can get into different patterns. There's different ways to support in all of that. So I like to use a variety. I like to use this as an opportunity for choice when I'm working with people too. Would you rather hear something with the guitar right now or do you feel like the ukulele would support you better with where you're at? Um, and then also, I have my harp here. And for each of you, the connection that you have, um, it might depend on how this sounds for you. When I was doing my visits this way in, in part, part of the time during the pandemic, um, 
having my instruments right here was really, really nice because sometimes I used to joke with people. It looked like I was moving in. I would show up with a harp and a guitar and I would have as much of it on my back, but they, were, they would wonder. So it was kind of nice here that they didn't have to feel like I was bringing all of that. It was just here and ready. I'm going to incorporate a tune that maybe you've heard this time of year. Can I get a thumbs up? Does that sound okay so far? All right. the harp here I try to incorporate things that aren't as familiar to Even in that space and time, you can feel the difference that it makes. You can see that difference in the experience that we have with one another. Um, and so to be able to share those moments with people and give them that space and that support um, can make all the difference. I started to go into, I'll touch on this just a little bit, the podcast there, I talk up if, you want to listen more, you want to learn more. I talk about um, nature and forest therapy and that a little bit more. In healthcare, um, and, e and now I think just as much as ever, as humans, all of us are needing experiences where we can um, reconnect and we can feel support. And sometimes that can happen through music. Sometimes it happens just being in nature. And so I've incorporated music therapy in that. Um, and I do those walks through Polk County Conservation usually. So um, there's lots of ways to learn more about that, but they're very similar in how it can provide a space of support for people. And let's see. I am trying to remember where we're at on time. Tiff should, I just send out the link for the video later. I think you're muted. Yep, thank you. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask if you could copy and paste um, after you're done all those links and then sure. the one with the video, that would be great into the chat. So yeah. that way, those of you that are participating, if you wanna copy and paste those into a Word document or something to, to look at those, I think that would be great, um, just um, considering time. But, um, but what, are you okay for if anybody has questions? Yes, that's what I wanted to make sure. If anybody has any sorts of questions or if there's something I touched on and you wanna know more about that, I think that would be a better use of our time together in these moments. Oh, absolutely. So go ahead. You can either unmute or you can write your questions in the chat, whichever you prefer. Oh, well, that's a good question. What um, drew me to become a music therapist? That is a wonderful question. When I was younger, I love music. I love learning instruments. And I really like to help people. Um, and my grandmother went um, to, a, I think it was a piano um, workshop and learned about music therapy and how music therapy is used in hospitals and can help people. And I was immediately inspired. It just really sounded like something that I wanted to try and do. It sounded like it could be challenging, but it sounded like something that would definitely be worth um, trying. So here's a good question too. What type of, what's my favorite type of music to play? 
Um, when I'm with people, that's a great question. I will play whatever it is that will help them to want to join in. So it might be something as simple as starting out with people. Um, I'll start playing a tune and then see if they recognize it. Like, dun, 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 dun. I mean, it's a song that <laughs> cross-culturally here in the United States, we use a lot. So, um, and then go from there, see where they take it. And then personally, I really like folk music. Uh, you saw the picture of me with a, a banjo and guitar and ukulele. Um, so folk music, Avit Brothers, uh, Lumineers, uh, Mumford and Sons, um, Iron and Wine. I love, I love folk music. And let's see, what classes would be helpful? I would encourage you to start early on science and things like anatomy, biology, those things that you don't really think of as much, they're just as important as also starting in on some piano and theory so that you can understand music. It's really important to me that when I bring music to people that I know a song. I don't want to pretend like I like trying to figure it out or trying to learn it. I want to do it from memory. I want it to be as natural as possible so that I can be with them in that moment. So starting early on music and keep at it. I would encourage you. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard, but keep at it. Keep at it. It's, it's really important to keep that. Um, can music therapists work with any age group? Yes. We say from birth until the time that someone passes away um, throughout their entire life. Neonatal intensive care units, um, they'll monitor, say, oxygen levels for babies, and that will increase when there's a music therapist that's providing live music. Sometimes it happens with recorded music, but it happens even more powerfully with live music. Let's see, instruments, how many instruments do I know how to play? Um, that's a really great question. It might be easier to ask me something I don't know how to play. Um, I really love uh, learning instruments. So I will tell you the instruments that I play well are um, piano, guitar, banjo, ukulele, harp, flute, and then Native American flute falls in there too. Then beyond that, I know how to play the accordion, but I'm really like bothering my neighbors with it. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit unpleasant right now. Or my my daughters, they, they're probably like, no, don't tell her to play the accordion. <laughs> um, let's see here. How many years of schooling did I take and would recommend? I did the four year with my bachelor's degree. I think that's definitely a great place to start. Um, if you're unsure about it, something like music education and music therapy is kind of nice because you'll get your clinical experiences right away and start to decide if it's something that you really feel passionate about. How long do I play every day? Mm, it depends on what season in my life I'm in. <laughs> in college, I would play like three or four hours a day. Now it might be mm, kind of here and there. It might be an hour total, um, depending on the day. Some, some days I don't get to use music as often. Um, and those are the days that I, I can definitely feel like, oh, I should have I should have slowed down and, and used some music. Um, um, let's see. Uh, do I have a favorite instrument? That's a good question. I would say one of my favorite instruments to, to be able to incorporate with a variety of people is a guitar. That's a good one to make sure that you have under your fingers and literally your fingers need to be prepared for that one because you have the have to build up calluses. So that one's really good. And I really have enjoyed learning the harp. It's a really special space to be in with people. And then what is the hardest instrument? Um, oh, and that reminds me, I wanted to show you another instrument really, really quick. Um, the harp is really pretty difficult because I really want to be present with people and I don't want it to feel overpowering to them. So I want to make sure that I know where that's at and that I can still be engaged with them. Okay. 
really quick before I go, this is a Moyo drum. Sometimes I'll use this um, and it's a relaxation instrument that's pentatonic. So you can play anything. It's kind of a nice relaxing sort of tone. You can just do something pretty simple with just the bass tones and then help to support people in a space of relaxation with that. It's very vibrational too. And one more question, what's the first instrument that I learned to play? I would say um, an instrument that I, I remember and I used often and then trained on was voice. And then beyond that, I learned the flute and then I learned the piano kind of all at the same time. Yeah. And then I, I appreciate this feedback. You wanted to study this, but it, the degree was not available. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that. It's definitely worth pursuing and even just sharing music with others is a really important way to be able to connect. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much everyone for your time, for your, your participation. I really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out to me directly too if you have more questions. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Huang Tran, and uh, I am an architect with Envision Architecture, Planning and Design. Uh, I've been in the field for almost 10 years now, uh, uh, nine years to be exact. Uh, and I graduated from Iowa State University uh, um, with a, a bachelor in architecture degree. Uh, I am an avid sketcher. I love to sketch. Oh, this is one of my comic that I just sketch on my uh, on my free time uh, and uh, I love old buildings uh, you know most people see a pile of old brick and uh, but I see uh, traditions I see craft and skills I see uh, the way people put time and effort into making these old buildings uh, and techniques that are no longer available to us uh, the goals today, uh, we're going to explore what exactly is, is architecture, and I will be walking you through uh, a day in the life of an architect, uh, just to kind of give you an example, and uh, quickly walk you through how to become an architect. Uh, I also have a video at the end. Uh, if we have time, I will uh, run that. If we do not, uh, I'll send you guys a link. So what is architecture, right? Um, We've heard this term a lot, and uh, it usually used to describe a building or uh, or types of buildings. Um, architecture, uh, in short, is the art and science of designing uh, and building structure. And see how I, I how I highlight and uh, separated art and science, uh, because these are two parts that have to work together in order for a building to have architecture. Uh, so we're going to jump into each part here and take a look at what exactly is art and what is exactly uh, what exactly is building science. So the art of architecture. Um, when you're an architect, you are the creator. You have to be creative, and uh, you have to put your personal flares, your personal style, into uh, a space that people will be occupying later. Uh, so uh, the art of architecture means to is a mean to uh, create a mean to uh, imagine to dream uh, to think about what spaces could be what buildings could be and they aren't always reality but we're going to come into that later so the art of architecture bring aesthetic and style into the structure and invoke emotion now, the science of architecture, um, you know, science, building science has come a very long way. Uh, in prehistoric time, uh, what you're, you see here is our structures that are found across the globe, right? They're found in Africa, in North America, in Asia, but they're basically, they're basically just sticks uh, that are put together and then uh, a layers that keep the rains and the sun out. Uh, so that was thousands of years ago. 
And then in uh, ancient time, people started using different materials, uh, more solid materials uh, like uh, stones and wood. And um, but the techniques were still very simple, right? Uh, like imagine the pyramid of Giza, uh, the picture at the top left here. Uh, it is essentially still a pile of stone uh, stacked on top of one another. And I say that sarcastically, right? Because uh, even though it's just a pile of stone, it is still a very impressive feat and nobody can figure out still how uh, everything was built, how everything was put together. Um, now comes modern time. We've come a really long way uh, in how building is built. Um, this is just an example of a, of a construction drawings that we do in our office uh, that shows the makeup of uh, the walls, the how foundations are put together, how roofs are put together. And uh, when you look at a building, you don't think about what all goes into a wall, but uh, in order to keep water out, in order to keep uh, the heat in, in order to keep you cool and warm, uh, it needs insulation, it needs a uh, gypsum wall, board. Uh, there, there are a lot of parts that go in uh, into the science of architecture to keep you comfortable in your space. So in short, the science satisfy the functional and safety needs of building users. Um, when you combine art and science, uh, that's when you have architecture, it was when beauty is combined with function. And just a couple of examples here of projects that our offices have done. This is the Waukee Innovation and Learning Center. Um, is uh, here in Iowa. Uh, by the way, our firms uh, operate mostly in Iowa. Our, our uh, policy is that we uh, don't travel for more than four hours away from Des Moines. <laughs> so it's great for me and my, uh, my family. This is the interior of the same building. This is for a high school, by the way. Uh, this is a private residence that we did in Colorado that tried to blend the building in with the uh, uh, with the landscape around it, the natural landscape around it. So you can note the uh, openness of the structure. That way uh, you can view and absorb all of that nature into the interior of your, uh, your home. Here's another shot. And uh, this is another building in, um, in Iowa, uh, single speed brewing company. Uh, sometimes uh, it's a very functional space. So uh, here you can see exposed steel, exposed uh, joist, uh, but uh, combined together with the old brick and, uh, and uh, the existing structure, it creates a beautiful structure that is then used functionally. So that was very quick, uh, just a quick overview of what architecture is. Um, uh, so jumping into the next topic here, I'm just gonna walk you through quickly through uh, what it's like to be, uh, to spend a day in an architecture office and uh, what skills does it take to bring uh, projects that are initially always a uh, project initially are always uh, ideas in your head to bring it to life into uh, uh, into buildings that people can occupy. So uh, a quick uh, uh, verbiage here, but architect is uh, derived from the Greek word architekton, uh, which means chief creator. And um, so you are that that means that you are the leader in creating a building. And that also means that you are working with a team, right? So uh, I always put this slide first when it comes to what do I do as an architect? I always collaborate with people. Uh, I never work in a team by myself. And um, as an architect, I am the leader of a team that try to put a building together. So some of the consultants and engineer, engineer that I might be working with include uh, civil engineers, structural engineer, 
electrical, uh, geotechnical engineers. Um, and this is kind of a simplified diagram of how we collaborate, but really uh, it gets really complicated. And as an architect, you have to be the team leader as well as the coordinator of all of these collaborations and communications. That's probably one of my favorite part about architecture, by the way, is the ability to work with people, uh, partners uh, and uh, clients and uh, exchanging information back and forth. Um, I learn something new every day uh, from talking to structural engineer, from talking to interior designer, you know, because uh, we don't know everything. So um, having people on our teams that are experts in their field uh, really help us uh, put together a successful project. Um, another part of my day is client interaction. Uh, this is a part that I love as well. Um, because as a service-based industry, we are, we are always building a structure for somebody else, right? You're never going to hear an architect uh, who, uh, or very rarely will you hear an architect who uh, design a building for himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, in talking to clients, uh, it's always important to understand their needs, uh, discussing design ideas, sharing progress, and, uh, you know, as a business mindset, sometimes you try to look for new work, uh, try to get the clients to come back. And uh, probably the most favorite part of all uh, during my day is to design. Um, I show you sketches before. Uh, these are some of the sketches that come out of our office. Um, sketching is probably one of my favorite ways of communication. Uh, you know, it's, you're just working with the tools that you have uh, using your hands and uh, a pencil and a piece of paper. Uh, it doesn't have to be, as you can see here, it can be very quick and dirty. It doesn't have to be a perfect drawing with shading or anything. It's the goal uh, is to get, your, um, to get your ideas across to somebody else, to a team members, to the client. Uh, uh, but nowadays, uh, um, in the compu computer age, uh, I think a lot of um, graphic communication can be done via uh, uh, software as well. And uh, uh, these are just a few softwares that, I, that we need to be efficient in the office in order to create graphics that com communicate uh, ideas to clients. Uh, Autodesk Revit, SketchUp, Sapphira. Uh, I can name a big list, but uh, these are just a few examples. Um, and with these software and uh, your skills, uh, you end up with drawings, uh, technical drawings like this, like floor plans, or you can come up with uh, 3D renderings that mimic uh, the final product uh, with real materials uh, and uh, spatial feelings. Um, another part of my day uh, that I could be doing uh, would be uh, observing construction of ongoing projects. And um, it takes, uh, this is a part that honestly I am still learning uh, along with uh, some of the more experienced member of my team. Uh, as an architect, you're the one designing the building, you're not the one building the building. Uh, but you need to understand what is possible uh, for the construction team, right? You cannot design a building that is impossible to build. Uh, and uh, because buildings are so complicated nowadays, uh, you need to uh, observe the progress once in a while to make sure that your client get exactly what they want from your drawing. Um, so uh, in short, it's, it's a lot of collaboration and a lot of thinking. Uh, now quickly jump to how, if you wanted to be an architect, what would be helpful for you? And the path that I took to become an architect. So the skills that you're gonna need uh, is uh, first and foremost, communication skills. Uh, this includes verbal communications, because you're going to be talking to team members, you're going to be talking to clients, 
you're going to be talking to uh, partners. Um, and then graphic communication skills uh, are important too, because uh, at the end of the day, architecture communicate their ideas through drawings. Uh, and then uh, a team of construction take those drawings to, to make a 3D, a physical building. So uh, uh, written skills is very important as well um, in describing your work, uh, in um, trying to get new work. Um, the second is reasoning skills. Uh, I put this here because uh, architecture is subjective. Uh, I, I want to say, I want to put that out there. Uh, a building that you think is beautiful might uh, just might just be incredibly ugly to somebody else. Uh, so there is a style and there is uh, a, an aesthetic that you like or that you think is good. You need to be able to reason your way into uh, convincing a client or your team members uh, that your solution is right. Um, problem solving skills is a good one as well. And this comes up a lot during design as well as during construction. Um, on a large project, uh, you're never going to be able to have a perfect set of drawings and you're never going to be able to get a, con a contractor that uh, build everything perfectly right? Because uh, we're humans and we just make mistakes. So uh, as soon as a problem arrived uh, to identify it and to come up with a solution to uh, address that instantly. Uh, resourcefulness. I'm, I'm going to be honest and say that, uh, you know, after almost 10 years of practicing, I don't know everything. Um, I'm in a position now where I'm, start, I'm starting to mentor people and sometimes I have to go to my mentor and be like, and ask him like, uh, hey, Henry, ask me a question today that I cannot uh, answer. Like, what do you think? So, uh, and sometimes my mentor would, you know, go to the internet or go to somebody else. So resourcefulness is a really good skill to have, not only in architecture, but in any field you're going to pursue. Because when you don't know something, who are you going to reach out to and who, uh, how are you going to find that resource is very important. Um, the last two skills, collaborations, uh, I've touched before, you're going to be working with everybody, with a large team, small teams. You're never going to be alone. So uh, the soft skill and the, the skill to collaborate with others is very important. And lastly, attention to details. Um, just because of the way building science is so complicated nowadays that uh, a little, little bit of attention to details uh, when you design these things will go a very long way. Quickly on uh, how, what I did to become uh, an architect. So as I, I mentioned uh, previously, I went to Iowa State uh, and I got a Bachelor of Architecture from Iowa State. It is a five-year degree, and uh, when you, if this is the path you decide to pursue, um, you would need to look into an accredited architecture program. Uh, because if you do not, it will take you longer. Uh, it might take you up to eight years of education. Uh, Iowa State, uh, just a little bit of a shout out, is a very good program. I think their master, their graduate program, as well as undergraduate, have been placed in the top 10 for several years, the top 10 in the country for several years. Um, so we have a very good programs there. Um, and then after you graduate from uh, a college, an accredited uh, program, uh, you'll need to work in a practice to earn experience. Uh, this would be, uh, this could be up to three years, just depends on how much you work and how, how fast you want to pursue this. Um, the last part before licensure is to take your examinations, uh, architecture registration exam, uh, all six of them. Um, and, uh, each of them average at about three to four hours. Uh, <laughs> I just got done with mine in, um, in, uh, oh man, when was this? In November of 2019. So a little bit more than a year ago. 
Um, it is it is the best thing uh, to pass all six, uh, and I I would advise you to try to take your test as soon as you can, <laughs> because I waited too long and it wasn't fun anymore. <laughs> So uh, after these three steps, uh, it sounds like a lot, but uh, really, if you're focused and you're uh, motivated, uh, it's a lot of self-motivation because you're not in school anymore, right? You're not trying to earn an A. You're not trying to pass a class. Uh, you're just trying to uh, reach a goal that you set for yourself. So after these three steps, you can call yourself an architect. <laughs> um, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to go back to any parts that you uh, that you uh, you missed, or uh, if you have any questions. Uh, Tiffany, do we have time for the video? Um, how long is it? Uh, I think it's about eight minutes. Okay, then yeah, we don't. Um, be okay. Five minutes left. However, I'm going to send a follow-up email with Crystal's links, a few of our 4-H links, and I'm happy to share. Is it a link that I could send? Um, your yeah. video? Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Um, and then we can do that. But we there are lots of great questions in the chat. So oh. if you'd like to address some of those questions. And then um, for participants, I'm going to pull up a poll, just some um, questions that we'd like to ask. And so while he's answering those questions, if you could answer those poll questions, that would be great. Thank you very much, Wong. All right. Okay, I'm gonna get to the list of uh, questions here. Uh, first question is, what softwares do you usually use? And um, the software that I use the most is probably 3D modeling software. So either SketchUp or uh, Revit, Revit for architecture. Uh, I think SketchUp, you can download a free version to try out for yourself. Um, but besides those, I use a lot of uh, graphic uh, software as well, like Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. And, you know, of course, the, the Word, uh, the Microsoft uh, suite is, is a must for anybody. <laughs> Uh, second question, how easy is it to get a job as an architect in Iowa? Does the future of the field, what does the future of the field look like? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, there's a second part to this question here. Uh, what is a typical career path for an architect? Are there many paths to move up in your career? So the first part, uh, how easy to, is it to get a job as an architect in Iowa? Um, I would say Iowa, surprisingly, is very easy. Uh, I've, I've lived in Iowa since uh, 2003, uh, so uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, I almost call myself a native, but um, and uh, after I graduated from Iowa State, I decided to stay here, and um, I've never had uh, any problem finding, uh, finding a job. Uh, I mean, of course, that uh, depends on how uh, how much you apply yourself to the field. Uh, and um, our architecture is a small community uh, in Iowa, um, so most likely you, you're going to know a lot of people. You know, gonna, you're going to know a lot of architects. Um, just you know, um, doing things like this, where you go out and meet people, learn new things about people, will really uh, help you get ahead uh, in finding a job. What does the future of the field look like? That is a crazy question. <laughs> I, um, I think with the, the way the world is so unpredictable at the moment, uh, and it seems like, um, Almost like uh, there's uh, sometimes we're kind of in crisis management management mode a little bit. Uh, I think the I would love to see the future of architecture to be able to address some of these problems that we have uh, because I know uh, uh, that we absolutely uh, is are able to do it through uh, the art and science of architecture. Uh, you know to provide basic shelters for uh, people in need. Uh, to plan cities so that we can provide 
um, so we can reduce homeless homelessness. Um, uh, so I'm a little bit of a dreamer, but I, I that's what I want to see uh, the field uh, evolve itself into. And uh, in some way, it is already. It is like that already. Uh, what is the typical career path of an architect? Uh, that is entirely up to you. <laughs> um, you, uh, my, uh, my professor in college used to tell me that uh, if you get an architecture degree, you can go and almost do anything because uh, when, and you know, when I graduated, I didn't understand what that mean. But I think after eight, nine years of practicing now, I, I, I'm starting to understand a little bit because when we work with so many people, uh, we manage so many teams, I think we develop a skill uh, that manage uh, and, uh, that, and just a, a problem solving mindset that uh, manage and coordinate people uh, to, to help get a project forward. Uh, so I've known people who uh, move on to um, principal to become a product designer. I know people who work for uh, Ford uh, Auto Company to design uh, uh, trim packages at, for cars. I know architects who have now become uh, software designers. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of options. Next question here is, do you work on one project at a time or do you have multiple projects going on at once? I, I uh, almost always work on multiple projects at once. Uh, depends on the size. Um, it could be two at a time, but uh, sometimes it could be four or five at a time. So not only are you managing the teams in your project, uh, you're as an architect, you're now <laughs> managing the teams on three, four different projects. Uh, question from Sarah Adamson. Uh, what does a geotech engineer do? What has been your favorite project you have designed? Um, a geotechnical engineer is somebody who look at the soil before we put down the foundation for a project and tell us uh, how, uh, tell us how much weight uh, that soil can bear um, and what kind of foundation they would recommend. Um, so you probably, you probably have never heard this before, but yeah, they, they are soil engineer. And uh, what has been your favorite project you have designed? Um, about three years ago, I had a chance to work on the uh, athletic uh, training complex for University of uh, Minnesota in uh, St. Paul. And uh, that was the largest project I've ever worked on. It was about $125 million. It was a, an incredibly big team that I worked with. And, uh, uh, and um, yeah, that's got to be one of my favorite projects. It turned out really nice. Um, I don't have a link to share with you right now. But if you have time to look up Lano Lake Excellence Center, uh, it's just a really nice building. Uh, is it hard being an architect? Uh, not if you love it. <laughs> no, I, uh, I was just kidding there. It, it really isn't. Uh, you know, I think you're watching movies and you're watching shows and you see uh, archi architects being portrayed as these uh, people who are living in high societies, uh, who goes to cocktail parties and their talks. And, and you know, that's not true at all. Like, uh, I'm just a normal guy. Uh, I'm not smarter than any of you. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and I've been an architect since uh, 2013, so uh, seven years. Man, I keep backtracking that number. <laughs> How has COVID impacted you as an architect? Uh, oh, that is uh, interesting. I have to think about that. I think all of the things I love about the field, uh, which is client interaction, uh, talking to teams or 
uh, discussing ideas with my uh, my my uh, my team, my partners. Um, we were forced to do all that in a, a virtual format, similar to how we're doing now. Um, and uh, at, at the beginning, that was very, very, very difficult for me. Um, so I, I think that would, would be the biggest change for me. I think that is the end of the question list. Okay, I think um, there are maybe two more. We'll do Any these other? last at the end. It says, would a welding inspector be a part of the collaboration process? And then did you yes. have to physics to become an architect? And then we'll have to. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, welding inspector. If if you are, I mean, if you're building a wood building, you would need to weld, right? So if you're building a, a steel building, yes, you would need to have a, a welding inspector to uh, inspect the structural soundness of your building. Uh, did you have to take physics to become an architect? Yes, that was a course that I had to take in high school as well as in college. Uh, I, it was a very basic beginner course though. Um, as an architect, uh, we rely mo a lot on our teams, on our consultants. So structural engineer, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers to do a lot of the calculation for us. We know uh, the surface of everything, but we don't know uh, the, the deep level of, uh, of these, uh, these disciplines. Thank you for watching. For more information on Polk County 4-H programming, connect with us by email at polk4h at iastate.edu or by phone at 515-957-5760.